Well, thank you very much, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here to um, actually leave the campaign office and come out into the real world. For the last couple of months, I've been working behind the scenes. I haven't been doing any speaking to any audiences about the uh, referendum, but putting all of the technical pieces of the campaign together, working with uh, the mayors and uh, with the Better Transit and Transportation Coalition, uh, who I see a couple of faces here. Uh, Bahar is one of the co-chairs, and, uh, and Peter Robinson is another one of the co-chairs that are here. And together, between the coalition and the uh, the Mayor's Council campaign, we've been working very hard to deliver the message about this exceptional plan and to also make sure that we do all of the things possible to rally support and ensure that voters turn out to vote. Um, it, this is an important day today, a critical day. We're one week from the day that the ballots will begin arriving in the mail. And uh, while this is a small room with a few people here, I'm hoping that it represents a much larger group of people that you're reaching out to, to ensure that people vote the right way and that they return their ballots. Uh, because it's going to be a close campaign, as we know from the polling that we're seeing. Um, the polling that you're seeing this morning in the paper is not as dismal as the numbers that we're seeing in our own polling. So we are quite optimistic that if we ensure that everyone comes out and votes, and especially students, um, when I come out here on the campus and see what's happening at the Loop and our campaign office is right next to the um, City Hall uh, Canada Line station and the people lining up for the B line there, we know the critical issues that we're facing and this is a critical vote. I, th I believe it's probably the most important vote that voters will have in this region in my lifetime to decide what the future of this region is going to be. So I want to talk a little bit about the plan. We all know why we need to make this decision. There's a million more people moving to this area, this beautiful area that attracts people from around the world. Uh, moving here over the next 30 years and by 2045 that means 700,000 new jobs, a million more people and potentially 3 million more cars coming to this region and we know that Right now, we're facing congestion that's starting to affect our lives. Imagine what we will face if we don't deal with the, the realities of building a, a, a transportation infrastructure, a transit system, and the roads and, and bridges that we need to deal with that. The number of cars on the road will increase, congestion will increase, trips will take longer. That means those of you that are coming out to school are going to find it harder to get to class on time. Those of you that are working are going to find it harder to get to pick up your children at childcare on time. And we're seeing that kind of thing happen already. Life is just going to get much worse if we reject this, if we don't get on with the issues that we need to get on with, and that's building the system that accommodates the population. Um, the kinds of things that we're seeing on overcrowding and buses being uh, pass, passing up uh, passengers waiting right now is only going to get much worse. So we're faced with this mounting uh, transportation challenge and the need for investment and uh, challenges that span the entire region. And knowing that, the Mayor's Council developed a plan early last year to address our region's growing transportation needs. And um, we're meeting almost weekly. The mayors came up with what I think is the first time that we've seen politicians sit in a room and come up with a plan that actually spans an entire region, offers something to all of their constituents, and deals with all of the key issues that need to be dealt with. They analyzed the growth forecast for each municipality for the region, um, and they had really difficult conversations uh, that really force them to balance all of their needs. When you have 21 people sitting around a table, all with different needs, some of them common needs, it's not an easy thing to do. And it's not often that we see um, mayors across a region coming up with a plan like this in such a short period of time. Any of you that followed the work on the um, uh, regional growth strategy know that it took a number of years to get consensus on that strategy on the way we um, plan our land use in this region. And I think under the pressure of this looming referendum, uh, we were able to respond much more quickly and come up with consensus on the, the network, the transportation backbone to support that land use plan. And uh, the result is a comprehensive and integrated plan that includes significant new investments throughout the region to address the region's transportation needs. And I think it's one of the, the most comprehensive plans that we've seen in a long, long time. Um, Someone said earlier that the connection between public health and transit, transportation infrastructure hasn't been a focus. I can tell you it was a focus of the mayor's discussions when they were putting this plan together. When they undertook that work, um, they knew that there was a need to support the region's goals for supporting healthy people, a healthy environment, and a healthy economy. And I remember as, as far back as almost 15 years ago, I was at a 
Congress for the New Urbanism, I think it was in Miami at the time, and saw the emerging work of the Robert, that was sponsored by the Robert Woods Johnson Foundation on this connection between public health, built form, and transportation. And I started to realize that it was something that we needed to address in this region, and thankfully people like Larry Frank and Anthony Pearl and others, Patrick Kahn, and they started looking at these connections, and I think we've been able to draw those connections very closely in this region, and they're reflected in this plan. The need for transportation to recognize these links between health um, is built on considerable amount of work that they've done. Um, and positively, a lot of this work was developed and relates to this region by these people in the room here and others. And we're lucky to have the, that expertise to draw on. And the mayors drew on that and Translink drew on that in informing what's in this plan. As a result of the collaboration, the mayors came up with a consensus on a 10-year plan, including a new funding source to pay for it. And the, the uh, provincial government told them that with that new funding source, they would need voter approval. In June, the mayors released uh, their vision, uh, and it's a vision that was designed to respond to the near-term challenge from congestion, overcrowding, and this revenue gap, as well as to ready the region for a million new residents by 2045. And as I said earlier, the million new residents could mean up to 600 to 700,000 more cars on the road, all in a system already that's bursting at the seams with regular traffic backups, uh, bus pass ups, and fast growing areas without any transit service at all. I was in uh, Coquitlam a, a year ago um, at a at a rezoning public hearing where they were talking about new development on Burke Mountain townhouse development and the residents were there, um, the, some existing residents who'd moved into new development there, protesting that this townhouse development only had two car parking spaces per unit and they were chastising the community, uh, the, the, the council saying, we need four parking stalls per unit because we don't have any transit up here. And they were, you know, these were larger townhouses with uh, families in them. And uh, I was there on another issue and I couldn't resist, but I had to get up and speak and say, if you're going to approve development with four parking spaces per townhouse unit, you will never have bus service up on Burke Mountain. And uh, in this plan, we're going to see places like that served with new bus service. Um, the vision outlined a plan of a seven $0.5 billion investment in uh, new transportation and transit infrastructures that, the infrastructure that will fund um, new buses in these existing new communities like Burke Mountain, increase the sea bus service, West Coast Express, Handy Dart, and uh, longer hours for night bus service. And it will improve and maintain uh, road, major road networks, which is important for people that still have to drive. It will increase uh, SkyTrain service on the Expo, Millennium, and Canada lines. And uh, it will build a new light rail transit system in Surrey, where a bulk of the money is going to, where they desperately need it, where growth is happening. It will extend the Millennium Line tunnel to Long Broadway in Vancouver to Arbutus and uh, serve UBC with a, a increased service with a new B line from, uh, from Arbutus, picking up on that extension of the Broadway line, and it will build a new Patella Bridge. And it's a very comprehensive plan. You see it outlined up here on the map. It's one that we've been talking to the community about in every part of the region. You'll see the advertising that's uh, in community newspapers, if you live in different communities, that talks about the specific deliverables to those communities. The plan includes investment in uh, major rapid transit, the Broadway subway, as I said. The, the design work on that is beginning in 2016 with construction um, slated to begin in 2020 and with completion in 2024 if this plan is approved. And I, th I will say that about every one of these benefits that I talk about. It includes a Surrey LRT system uh, along 104th and King George. Um, the design work on that again can begin next year with construction to begin in 2019 and with completion in 2022. And I say that's if this plan is approved despite what you might hear from others in Surrey, that system will not get built without this plan being approved. Uh, it includes ALRT or LRT on Fraser Highway with design to begin in 2021 and construction to begin in 2024 with completion in 2027. It includes as well as transit, and uh, let's not forget that this is a truly a multimodal plan. It includes improvements to the um, region's major roads and bridges. The major uh, road network plays a central role in the region's transportation system, carrying both uh, people, commuters, goods and, goods and services by foot, bicycle, bus, car, and truck. 
For drivers and goods movers, we're committing $36 million a year to maintaining and repairing uh, 2,300 lane kilometres of the major road network. So that means that every um, municipality in the region will have major improvements to the major road network. Plus, as I said, the Patella Bridge, which is um, designed on that bridge, can start this year and construction will begin in 2018 and be completed um, in 2022. The plan also commits to improvements to the existing transit routes, um, 220 new cars for the SkyTrain system, including, I believe, in Richmond, the Canada Line, uh, Richmond and Vancouver, adding uh, to uh, making those three-car trains, station upgrades to modernize those stations and allow that to happen. And the real backbone of the service is the bus system. And across the uh, network, the plan will provide a 25% increase in bus service. That includes 11 new B lines. And a result of the, this transit investment, 800,000 more people will be able to walk to frequent uh, bus service. And that's where transit is available at 15 minute intervals or less. That's a huge improvement in this region. More than 800,000 people will be now accessible to that frequent bus service. This increase includes um, 400 new buses, a new C bus to increase frequency to 10 minutes at peak times and 15 minutes at other times crossing Burrard Inlet, and an 80% increase in the night bus service. And any of you that are working shifts know how important that is, and any of you that enjoy entertainment in downtown Vancouver know how important that is. The plan also supports seniors and people with disabilities, including improvements to the handy dart service and major investments to our stations and transit stops to improve accessibility across the region. 2,700 kilometers of bikeways, including 300 kilometers of fully traffic separated routes will make cycling a safer choice for many. Um, today, only a million dollars per year goes to cycling from TransLink, but this will increase significantly to $13 million per year. So that's a huge improvement for cyclists. Better connections to transit through pedestrian improvements at or near transit stops and stations for cyclists, and that will help to make the most of transit investments by improving access to transit. So how do we mobilize the yes vote? That's what we're all working towards. And tomorrow, a week from today, uh, when those ballots start arriving, we need to be convinced that we are going to go out there and convince our friends, family, neighbors, and everyone else that they need to consider this important choice and mark their ballots. And we have, as I say, this um, broad coalition of people, the Mayor's Council, TransLink, the Better Transit and Transportation Coalition. All of the municipalities are active in this. Municipalities of Vancouver and Surrey are really taking an active lead. Um, in Vancouver, you're seeing the mayor out there almost every day speaking on this. The mayor of Surrey, who's a co-chair of the Mayor's Council, is working very actively there. Surrey has a huge advertising campaign that they start tomorrow with um, a wrap of their community newspaper explaining the benefits directly to Surrey people. The kind of work that we're doing, uh, we have out on the street, um, uh, we have street teams that are working of canvassers that are intercepting people at transit stations in other high traffic areas. In a couple of weeks, you'll see many of those people shift to door knocking. We're going to try something that's never been tried in this region before, but has been do done elsewhere. We're going to knock on doors and try and pick up ballots from people and ask them to help them facilitate their voting and get their ballots to return back to Elections BC. And it's, uh, it'll be targeted because we can't do it in every neighbourhood across the region, but it'll be in those areas where we think we have good support because we need to turn that support out to win. What can you do to help uh, deal with this? You can uh, register and remind others to become registered if they're not already on the voters list. If they voted in the last municipal election, chances are they will be. They can go on to Elections BC website and uh, find out all of the information on how to register on online or on the telephone. You can pledge to vote yes and encourage others to pledge to vote yes on the Better Transit and Transportation uh, website. There's a pledge form there. You can mail in your ballot and remind others to do so between March 16th and May 29th. And we want, to do, we want people to mail in those ballots early. We don't want to have to wait until the end when we aren't sure what effort we can put into it to, can, to get those final ballots at the end. And every ballot is going to be crucial. So the faster we can get those ballots in, the better. 
You can share your stories and comments on social media and personal stories are so important. It's hard in mass advertising to get those personal stories across, but all of you have personal stories about your transportation needs and about how they're met and they're not met and it's important that you share those. You can volunteer with the, the coalition. Um, Bahar can help you with that and if you're on campus here, hopefully you're already part of that. You can hand out pamphlets and buttons, host a gathering. Uh, some people are doing ballot parties at their house where they're gathering their friends together, telling them to bring their ballots, having a discussion about the issues and filling out their ballots, seeing, sealing the envelopes and getting them in the mail right then and there. And most importantly, um, you can vote yes because we need everyone to do that. It's going to be a close vote and we know that uh, that we're not going to be able to make this region the, the place that we expect it to be in the future, the place that we've all enjoyed with high quality of life if we don't put the infrastructure in place. And the only way that's going to happen is if this um, referendum is approved. And uh, I hope all of you will see the urgency in that um, and share with people the fact that if they decide to vote no, they could be risking their own future in this region and, and compromising a lot of in terms of quality of life in this region. So thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to share the plan with you. Thank you, Bob. Perfectly on time, too. I uh, now invite Larry Frank up to uh, start talking about some of the health benefits of investment. Larry, which one is you? This one? Oh, there you are. And for those of you that may have just come in, um, we'll be doing questions uh, after all five presentations have uh, concluded. There we go. Thank you. No well, I want to start. Uh, thank you, Bob. That was really helpful to hear the plan and very inspiring to know all the effort that is happening. I think I'm a little bit worried, uh, I'll get into the science in a moment, but on the political side, I'm worried that if there was a vote that was negative, it would mean that the government would then use that as a marker to not bring forward, that that would be the sign from the public that means that people don't want transit investment, and that's not what we're hearing. So I think it's very important uh, the way the vote goes for every, every reason possible. There is a little bit on evidence, though, that I will talk about today. Um, this is a new area of research. Uh, there hasn't, like, about 10, 15 years ago, if I had to give that, this exact talk, I wouldn't have much to say. But the good news is that there's a lot to say, and it's very recent. That always makes it interesting. So if it actually, if I can. Um, so first of all, I, I think you know we're, we're at a, a point in time, uh, which uh, seems like every point in time, but right now we're at a major point in change. And I'd like to refer back to Benjamin Disraeli's quote uh, about change. Um, and uh, um, we are a progressive country, um, and change is constant. And so we're feeling the pain of change. Um, so how do we get from transportation to cost? It's really not that complicated. In fact, it's somewhat intuitive. What you build, transportation infrastructure, you build roads, you make driving easier. You build transit, you make taking transit easier. It's pretty simple. But that affects, it's complex along the way. Um, that affects development. Developers make decisions about where to build and what to build. And the signal is often the infrastructure that we create through our transportation decisions. As Bob said, that's the backbone. That's the spine. That affects travel behavior. So that's a lot of the work we do, study land use and travel patterns. Patrick and, and um, Anthony and I do a work on this topic and look at how travel behavior responds to the type of communities and quality of life that you create. Where we go from there is the health effect. So if you look at the path across the top, build roads, you get development oriented towards roadway, and you get travel behavior in cars, and you have a certain health effect. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, it's not great, uh, to be honest. Sedentary time in cars, I did that study, showed that driving causes obesity. It's been replicated repeatedly over and over again. The one big outcome I got out of that was my high school friends saying, you get paid to prove the obvious. I told him I'd rather prove something that makes sense than something that does not. But we are able to quant <laughs> I had to have an answer, right? So uh, anyways, and that cost us a lot of money. That we know. So the other, other way to go is the synergistic relationship between transit and active transportation uh, and how that affects walking, better heart uh, health, better cardiovascular health, uh, and reduced uh, chronic disease. So let's go right into it. So there's a lot of new studies. Uh, National Institutes for Health in the U.S. has been on this 
Canada Institutes for Health Research, we hope, will be too. We're certainly working on proposals for them. A recent study in Los Angeles evaluated the impact of the new exposition line, brand new study on travel patterns, activity levels, and greenhouse gas emissions. Measured physical activity objectively, uh, really did a good job, I think used GPS as well. Reduced their daily travel in cars by 10 to 12 miles, very significant significant reduction, CO2 emissions by about 30%, and experience about an eight to 10 minute increase in physical activity per day. You only need 30 minutes of moderate physical activity a day to get the health requirement to reduce the likelihood of chronic disease. Other studies, in Montreal, a study found transit users got a quarter of their daily recommended levels from transit use alone, just walking to and from transit. To be honest, it's probably higher. Um, a recent study in Salt Lake City showed um, a 19% increase in the number of participants who rode rail after opening the new line. Repeatedly, if you create a better option, people will in fact use it. It's all about time. If you can save time, you can access new markets, you can get into that transit choice population. The transit dependent population are already using it. They actually get hurt in other ways. They get displaced by increased land value that we've seen happen here because we don't have enough walkable urban form relative to the demand for it. That's why it's so expensive. Basic microeconomics. So we're looking at rail use associated, was also associated with increased mixed use and density. Transit users get needed activity levels. Transit users accumulate anywhere between 12 to 18 minutes of additional walking per day compared to non-users. Uh, that was shown in three separate, we have a one, two, four separate studies. Lots of data there. We found in Atlanta about a almost a three and a half increase in the likelihood people would get the amount of physical activity they need if they use transit. And that was even in Atlanta. So we're finding the results all over the place. It's consistent. It's intuitive. A study in Charlotte, North Carolina, Carolina found transit users were on average six and a half pounds lighter than non-users and 81% less likely to become obese over time. That is a longitudinal study pre-post. Um, that's a whomping finding on that 81% though. So anyways, this is another study we did years ago. This is the one on driving and obesity. Each hour in a car is a 6% increase in the likelihood of obesity. You may say, ah, 6% doesn't matter. There's a lot of 6%. There's a lot of hours in cars, a lot of time in cars going on there, and we have here too. Every additional kilometer walked is about a 5% reduction. So you get a, a two directions to go. One is up and one is down. So the difference is considerable. This is just a graphic I had to include. It came out at the time 10 years ago. I feel like we're in the same moment. Um, it doesn't seem to pass. I'm waiting for it to pass <laughs> so that we get on with this and start to understand. The I think that's the purpose of today and the campaign overall. Our part of this little piece of it is the public need to come out of this understanding the connection between transportation decisions, land use decisions, and health. Because if you make them separately, you make the wrong choice. So just a week ago uh, in the paper, I opened the paper in the morning, I see air quality down as car use rises. So air pollution, huge issue uh, in, in health. Lots of evidence on that. And I also notice in the same, what a perfect picture. Bahar is noticing this. You have, <laughs> it's the whole story. It's the whole study. You've got Vancouver, 1.6 1, 1. million, Richmond, over a million in Burnaby. And then you see all the problems. And then the ba bags of bald eagles off to the right, just to add a little <laughs> extra. <laughs> It's all related. We can come up with any reason why everything is related here. That's right. It's all related. So anyways, air quality. Air pollution leads to respiratory ailments. We know this. Hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. Tremendous evidence in this area. Michael Brower, who couldn't be here today, is one of the world's leading experts here at UBC on this topic. A recent study found that increased investment in public transit could reduce transportation-related emissions by 40% by 2050. Our air is getting worse, apparently, so we need to work on this. Air pollution has a negative effect on cardiovascular health, whereas physical activity has a beneficial one. So we need to work on this. Transit's a way to solve that. Traveling safely. Transit's safe. Three decades of data from 100 cities revealed a 10% increase in passenger miles on transit was associated with a 1.5% reduction in traffic-related fatalities. That's only a 10% increase, so you get a bigger effect as that increases. Crash risk per kilometer of travel is substantially lower for all forms of public transit as compared to passenger car or truck use. We understand why that would be the case. 
less chronic disease. Several studies have shown that compact, walkable, transit-oriented communities, which you don't get if you don't build transit, by the way, uh, with improved health outcomes include reduced blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. Multiple studies on this. Uh, a study we did in San Diego of 18,000 people just last year, two years ago now, uh, found a 10% reduction in type 2 diabetes risk and a 15% reduction in cardiovascular disease risk from living in a more walkable, transit-supportive environment. And that became part of a software tool to predict health outcomes like the one we used to show Surrey's downtown would have significant health benefits if it was able to be built. Surrey's downtown plan will not be built if, they, if transit is not invested in a way to make that density happen. Patrick will probably tell you there's a five-fold increase in density planned for Surrey's downtown. That is a very different downtown than it looks today or even will even a little bit from now unless the transit investment goes forward. Reducing travel time um, um, increases ridership, of course. So a proposed project, the proposed project that Bob uh, went through uh, will provide access to frequent transit for 70% of the metro area and residents will save 20 to 30 minutes per day on some of the region's most congested corridors. Metro Vancouver residents, um, in another study, um, residents are most walkable transit supportive neighborhoods were nearly twice as likely to make a transit trip in, in a usual week. In Seattle, um, different study showed a 10% reduction in travel time on transit is associated with about a 4% increase in transit use. And there's actually something called a cross elasticity, um, which is in fact, it increases walking as well because the two modes are synergistic. So you build transit, you reduce travel time, you make it more uh, cost effective to use transit for walkers and transit riders. Um, saving money, now for the punchline. Okay, so mortality and morbidity or disease. I'm gonna do mortality first. Over five and a half billion dollars, so living longer. A study found that over $5.5 .5 billion in 2012 dollars wages are lost in our country each year due to premature death attributable to excess weight. Um, an additional 3.8 billion is lost to premature death attributable to physical inactivity. So follow this Kruger study, I'll go, come back to it. Uh, a recent report uh, by the American Public Health Association showed a potential savings of $23 million in adjusted life years through a third increase, a tertile, in street connectivity. That's living in a neighborhood with connected streets versus cul-de-sacs that are disconnected in a more suburban fashion. Uh, that was uh, for about 5,000 people. So a small amount of people shows a net increase of 23 million if you could increase that connectivity. That's the exact proposal that Surrey's trying to do with its downtown is break those big blocks apart into more walkable fabric. 5,000 people is about a census tract. On the morbidity side, on the disease side, approximately six billion in healthcare cost is spent in Canada, are attributable, are attributable to being overweight or obese. Canada spends 8.4 billion um, annually on healthcare in 2012 dollars, attributable to excess weight or physical inactivity. Another 10.3 billion of wages are lost annually from individuals on long-term and short-term disability due to disease attributable to obesity and physical inactivity. So you have another argument, the indirect effect. We're talking $29 billion. The bottom line is that this transportation health connection is big dollars. And that is something we're talking about with the transit investment is big dollars. Well, here's a big dollar argument to build it. Saving money. The same study, again by Kruger, found that Vancouver, met our region, loses $2 billion annually to health care costs and lost wages combined from inactivity, obesity, and lost productivity from that study. So here we go. For every additional 1% of residents able to reach physical activity recommendations and healthier body weight, we would expect to see, according to their study, $20 million in annual economic benefits. So let's do the math. A 12% increase, still fairly modest, would get us $240 million. How much are we after here? $250 million a year? So perhaps even from one pathway alone, there's evidence of why this makes good financial sense to support. Unmet demand for transit supportive communities is considerable. Um, a recent survey we just released last fall of about 1,200 people in our region found that one out of every three residents in auto-oriented neighborhoods in the outer metro Vancouver area, which are less walkable, would actually prefer to live in a transit supportive environment. So not only is there a healthcare benefit, it's an undersupplied commodity that many people would want if they had the choice and could afford it. 60% 
of survey participants stated a willingness to trade off features of auto-oriented environments for walkable communities served by transit. This is a map that we often call walkability in Vancouver, in our region, but it actually walkability is transit supportiveness. It's mixed use, it's dense, it's compact, it's how we predict ridership. TransLink is using the data uh, with us in partnership and using it to determine their frequent transit network and pedestrian access, and it predicts, and look at the surface of our region, not too much of it is very walkable, and Dr. Daly is gonna talk a little bit about how that relates with the network and how many people are underserved and who would benefit. So in closing, transit supportive or not, we have the ability to show you what, what different factors that go into transit supportiveness. I mentioned density, mixing of uses, a connected street network, having retail set up to the street and a good pedestrian environment, all things supported by this plan. But old habits die hard. <laughs> That's me at 11 years old and here. <laughs> I dug this picture out for you and it just shows I started off a driver. I still drive, but it makes sense to take transit and the way to make it make sense is to invest in this plan. So I'll leave you with that, with a metaphor of our quality of life is what we build is the foundation of the pyramid of our health and quality of life. That affects our, our behavior, travel patterns, activity levels, which affects the quality of the environment, which inspired us to be here and move here in the first place, which again leads back to quality of life. So I look forward to hearing the rest of the talks and thank you for your interest and time. That, ladies and gentlemen, is how you synthesize evidence. <laughs> and you did it a minute ahead of schedule, too. Uh, yeah. Here. Uh, these ones. Yeah. My health, my community. Next up, uh, we have Dr. Patty Daly. And as I said in the intro, she is going to be presenting some brand new, fresh off the presses data from the My Health, My Community survey. Patty. Thank you very much. And it's my pleasure to be here today to talk about this important topic. I think. Uh, students are going to be the key to winning a yes vote in the referendum, so it's really important that those of you who are here today are ambassadors for a yes vote. I'm going to talk about, as Larry mentioned, some hot off the press data, some analysis from the My Health, My Community survey that was undertaken by Vancouver Coastal Health and Fraser Health. Uh, this important report analyzed that data uh, to look at the relationship between transportation here in Metro Vancouver and health. So it takes what uh, Dr. Frank has described the evidence from the literature and really puts it in our local context. So I'm going to start by talking about why we did the survey and what it is. And so we need to go back to uh, what makes people sick and in contrast what makes our population healthy. And for those of us working in the healthcare system in Vancouver Coastal Health, we have a $3.4 billion budget. We're closing in on 50% of our provincial budget, but it's not the hospitals and the healthcare services that keep you healthy. It's, it's really, they really attribute, account for about 20% of the health of the population. This slide says 25% because it was prepared by physicians, but it's probably closer to 20%. What really keeps us healthy are those underlying determinants of health, things like early childhood development, income, housing, employment. And if you look at the bottom there, 10%, and maybe now it's, it's a little bit higher if we were to look at the evidence, of uh, population health is determined by our environment. And this, is, uh, this was a slide prepared by physicians, and even they recognize not just air quality, but civic infrastructure is important to population health. So wh why did we do a survey of the population? Well, Vancouver Coastal Health delivers health services to mainly sick people, uh, but we are also responsible for keeping the population we serve healthy. And we also need to predict in future what are likely to be the demands on our healthcare system. In a similar way, the municipalities with whom we partner, um, schools, non-governmental organizations, all want to understand the changing demographic of our population. So how do they do that? Well, they used to rely on things like the long-form census, which the federal government canceled. And they rely on things like the Canada Community Health Survey, which is really our only large national survey that looks at some of the risk factors for chronic health conditions. So that's a survey that tells us what our smoking rate is, whether or not we're getting enough physical activity, uh, whether or not we're eating healthy. But uh, it, it only surveys 0.5% of our population. So in our region, it doesn't allow us to uh, give a municipal level data to the municipalities with whom we work. It doesn't allow us to produce neighborhood level, level data. So we decided to embark on a population health survey in Vancouver Coastal Health and Fraser Health, and we aim to get four times the sample size of the Canada Community Health Survey. 
This uh, survey was done over the course of a year. It was completed last year. Uh, we asked questions in these areas. Uh, health status, lifestyle, those risk factors that put you at risk for chronic disease, healthcare access. It did ask about the built environment, how you commute to work or school, whether you have uh, recreational facilities near where you live, about your neighborhood, and about community belonging. There were over 33,000 respondents, and this is the first report or analysis we've done of that data. So here are the results. Now this is based on 28,000 of the respondents who live in Metro Vancouver and who indicated they commute either to school or work. And you can see that if we look at how people are getting to school or work, 55% of people are uh, either driving or a passenger in a car. 43% use what we call active transportation. That's transportation that's human powered and we include of course walking and cycling, but we also include transit because each transit trip is going to include some human powered uh, usually walking to a bus stop or transit stop. So still most people uh, by car. Then we looked at uh, how people commute to school or work and we compared those who commute by car to those who use active transportation based on a number of other uh, parameters within the survey. And here are the, a summary of the results that we found and there's copies of this report available to you if you didn't pick one up on the way in. So across the top, uh, whenever you see a green, that's a positive association. You can see that for active transportation, we found that it was associated compared to those who commute by car with lower body mass index. We asked everybody to self-report their height and weight so we ca could calculate their, their body mass indexes, which is what we use to determine levels of obesity in the population. We found it positively associated with walking 30 or more minutes per day, which as Dr. Frank mentioned, is the recommended uh, amount of daily physical activity for all adults in Canada. We found it positively associated with getting 150 plus minutes of physical activity per week. And we found it positively associated with something we call the wellness score, which is a combination of uh, factors such as whether or not you smoke, whether you're eating well, whether you get your physical activity. So what this indicates is that people who use active transportation walk more, have a lower body mass index, and have a healthier lifestyle in general comp compared to those who commute by car. Now we broke it out by uh, those who cycle or walk versus those who take transit because we didn't want people arguing, well, it's only the, the, the cyclists and walkers who are responsible for those associations. And you can see uh, that the associations are strongest are, for cycling and walking also include self-reported health and a sense of community belonging, and I'll get to that in a minute. But transit users compared to car users do have a lower body mass index, do walk, uh, are more likely to walk 30 minutes or more a day and have um, more likely to have a high wellness score. So if we look at uh, the most significant findings from the study, the, uh, this is the, the finding on the previous slide regarding those who, who self-reported their w being overweight or obese. So for those who are commuting uh, uh, by active transportation, they are 33% less likely to report being overweight or obese compared to those who commute by car. And for those who bike or walk, it's 48% 40, less likely. And those who use transit, 22% less likely. And these are all significant findings. In terms of cycling, walking or taking transit and relationship to physical activity, uh, if you commute by those means, you are twice as likely to, to get your 30 minutes or more of walking per day compared to those who commute by car. So this is local data that confirms what what Dr. Frank found in, in the studies that he talked about, that those people who take transit, bike or walk to work or school are much more likely to meet those daily phys physical activity guidelines. It's much, much easier to incorporate physical activity into your daily life if it's how you get to work or school. You're less likely to do it if your medical health officer just tells you to exercise. We know that doesn't work. So I don't keep people healthy, Jennifer. It's really uh, what your neighborhood looks like, what kind of a city you live in. Now, uh, some of the other results that I think are important to mention. We also asked people how long it took them to commute to, to work or school. And this is in one direction, so double it for the overall commute time. And you can see that overall, it takes people in Metro Vancouver 30 minutes to commute one way to school or work. And then you see it broken down by the various modes of commute. Uh, the shortest commute time, which is, is not surprising, is, is among those who walk to school or work, 15 minutes each way on average. For car and, and bicycling, it's equivalent, 25 minutes on average. Of concern is that those who reported they take transit, their one-way commute time is 45 minutes. This is an indication that we need investment in transit infrastructure so that we can reduce that commute time. Uh, you remember that the mayor's plan has a goal of reducing commute by 20 to 30 minutes overall per person. And this data supports that there is a need for that type of investment. 
We also wanted to look at uh, what impact does commute time have on overall health? Now, Dr. Frank mentioned his great work, which shows if you're sitting in a car, uh, your risk of obesity goes up 6% for every hour you're sitting in a car. This, this is data just based on car drivers. Most people, remember, 55% of our respondents commute to school or work by car. We compared that to their sense of community belonging. And what we found is uh, uh, that the longer your commute time by car, the lower your sense of community belonging. So uh, if, you, if your commute by car is less than 10 minutes, if we compare that to those who have 50 minutes or more, and again, and again this is one way, a significant drop off. In fact, uh, if you spend 50 minutes or more uh, commuting one way by car, so that's 100 minutes total, more than two hours per day, you're 50, you have a 58% lower sense of community belonging compared to those who only have 10 minutes, uh, only have a 10 minute commute. So it's not just obesity, it's your ability to interact with your community, and that's an important determinant of health, we know that. So this is another reason we need to reduce those commute times, not only for people who take transit, but for drivers too. We looked at some of the determinants of transit use, and we found that it was highest, not surprisingly, among the young and among those who are 70 and older. Uh, important, we found it's higher for people who have any chronic health condition. They rely on transit. One of the investments that the Mayor's Council is going to be making is in the Handy Dart service, for example. We have one of the most accessible transit ser services in the world. That's very important for people with health conditions. We found that transit use is low among parents with young children. Imagine trying to get on the 99 bus with your stroller in the morning. This is an area that we need to improve upon in our system. And important, the last two points, that among recent immigrants, visible minorities, and Aboriginal people, much higher transit use. And some of that uh, relates to the next finding, which is that we know that among people who have very low income, transit use is much higher. So on the left, we have people who, uh, p the use of transit for people who earn, earn under $20,000 per year. And we see that there's a dramatic drop off in transit use as income goes up. Transit is not, is not a choice, it's a necessity for people living in poverty. So this vote is not just a vote about health, it's a, it's a vote for equity. We need to make sure that the people who really need transit to, to access those other determinants of health, school, work, recreational facilities, sometimes even safe and healthy foods, because some poor neighborhoods don't even have access to that. Their only way of, of reaching those important determinants is through transit. And even within our healthcare system, many of our staff, including some of those who are amongst our lowest paid, rely on transit to get to work. So even for people who don't, want to, don't feel they need to vote yes because they always drive to work, they are relying on people every day who need transit to get to work. So I'm going to finish with a couple of maps that uh, look at some of the data mapped out across the region. So this is a map um, that shows um, uh, in purple the, the areas where people are more likely to use active transportation to commute to school or work. So, uh, and, and light purple areas are those populations that are, have a lower than average use of active transportation. So it's, it's interesting, you can certainly see that Vancouver, much higher than average compared to the rest of Metro use of active transportation. Apart from that, uh, we've, uh, we've also put on there the um, existing um, rapid transit routes, uh, the B lines in red and the Canada line and the, the SkyTrain in purple and the West Coast, or sorry, in blue, and the West Coast Express. And we've also put on the proposed uh, uh, increases in the mayor's plan in dotted lines. And you can see that currently, um, apart from Vancouver, the areas where people are more likely to use active transportation at the end of the Canada line in Richmond, uh, along uh, the, the SkyTrain in Burnaby, New Westminster. But apart from that, it's pretty bleak. But if you look at the dot of li dotted lines, they're going to serve some of those light purple areas where, where people right now are not using active transportation. We can reverse that, and this is a graph that shows the people that are, or a map that shows where people, the people who are more likely to commute by car the, in the dark purple. And here you can see those dotted lines are going to serve those communities, whether it's in Langley, in Surrey, even in West Vancouver and North Vancouver, we can see new B, uh, a new B line that will serve some of those communities in Richmond, even in Vancouver and South Vancouver, uh, where there, there's a pocket of people more likely to commute by car, there will be a new B line. So here are key messages. Uh, active transportation, uh, the people in Vancouver who use active transportation have a lower body mass index, less likely to be overweight and obese, walk more each day. Uh, cyclists and walkers are more likely to meet their weekly physical activity goal. Active transportation users have more positive, other more positive lifestyle attributes. 
car users who have to commute for long periods every day have a lower sense of community belonging. And we know that transit use is, is most important for some of our disadvantaged populations. So this is really an important vote for public health. You know, I was thinking back five years ago today, we were hosting the Olympics in Vancouver. And after the Olympics, I, was, I gave a number of presentations and I was asked about the most important public health legacy of the Olympics. Many people thought it might, be a, it might kickstart people to be more physically active. The athletes might inspire them, which didn't really happen. And we did, ha we did have some good public health benefits. We've got new community centers that people are using. But the most important public health benefit was the opening of the Canada Line which is now used by 130,000 people every day. Those people aren't, aren't polluting, are getting more physical activity each and every day. And now we have an opportunity to expand that public health benefit. For the students here, this is a mailbox. That's where you're going to need to vote in the referendum. So make sure you, you get out there and get your friends' ballots into those mailboxes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Daly. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Anthony Pearl up next for his presentation. I'll find it here. There you are, Pearl Slides. Named after one of my favorite programming languages. There we go. Thanks, thank Anthony. you. <clears throat> well, uh, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you uh, to uh, Larry and colleagues at UBC for inviting me uh, out here. Um, I don't do uh, health research, uh, but uh, more policy and uh, urban uh, planning research uh, on transportation. But I think I learned uh, a lot about that uh, uh, link with uh, health as a result of the invitation, which uh, uh, I got to come and share uh, the connections uh, with you. So I'd like to talk about how one of the uh, prescriptions for uh, better health uh, in cities is uh, uh, economic opportunity and to make sure that people understand just what a uh, direct connection there is between uh, investment in better uh, urban and regional transportation and that uh, economic opportunity. Um, the first point uh, is that uh, this is uh, an urban uh, century that we're uh, living in. A majority of the world's population live in cities and they're being drawn there uh, every day uh, as we speak. Uh, we talk about uh, a million uh, people coming to this region over uh, a 30 year time span. I personally think that's uh, somewhat conservative. There's a million people a month moving to cities around uh, the uh, world, most of them on uh, their own two feet, walking from uh, subsistence rural uh, uh, economic uh, poverty uh, to cities where they may or may not uh, do well uh, right away, but they're drawn by the opportunity the opportunity for uh, economic and uh, social uh, uh, well-being. And uh, uh, that's a, a phenomenon that goes uh, across the world. And when we look at many developing uh, parts of the world, we see the uh, urban failures and challenges to <clears throat> meet that, um, that demand. We can do better. I think we're in lucky uh, so far to be in the category uh, very close to the top, if not at the top, of the exceptional cities in the world that uh, have that uh, growth and development that draw people here and are able to do so it with uh, an incredibly high quality of life, livability, that makes uh, this place uh, the envy of so many uh, around the world. We're celebrated uh, for creating uh, opportunity and livability. And when it comes to transportation, I think uh, a fundamental choice that was made uh, a generation ago, uh, in, uh, which made it possible to develop uh, the skyline uh, in uh, uh, the uh, downtown peninsula that you see uh, here, um, was not to build uh, an urban expressway that would have uh, changed very much the uh, trajectory, both uh, in terms of infrastructure, mobility, and development uh, of our city in the 1970s. Um, I say that our biggest uh, success in, in uh, decision making for urban transportation in this region was not making the wrong choice in the 1970s. But that can only take you so far, and it has taken us uh, very far. You're looking at billions of dollars of investment and uh, many uh, tens of thousands of people who live, work, and play very happily uh, without cars uh, in that part of uh, Vancouver. Now it's time to uh, face the next big uh, choice, which is why we're here today. And usually when you're at a decision point, and I think polls and you know uh, the uh, sort of uh, debate that's going on now shows when you reach a, a point of decision, there's usually two sides to the coin and people see the same thing from two 
very different uh, perspectives. Um, some people think it's great to have uh, lots of traffic and streets because uh, that shows that we're growing and things are going to work out and other people see the challenges uh, of that. Our choice really is about uh, moving people, more people, as a, a million at, at a minimum, but uh, quite possibly uh, more. Uh, we can talk about that in the questions if you want to know why I think uh, there's even more likely to come here in a very different uh, uh, way than uh, the million that are currently projected. But we have to, if we want to keep the quality that has made this region uh, such an enviable place to be, I think we need to uh, choose the path that will do it with less money. Uh, investment, uh, both by users and for infrastructure, less land take, more compact, uh, efficient uh, uh, use of land, and of course, less carbon. If we're going to have uh, a future as a civilization, we're going to have to move to post-carbon uh, cities and post-carbon mobility. And our choice uh, will uh, take us in very different directions. I think it's pretty clear where the direction of not investing in the uh, package that's been put forward by the Mayor's Council would lead. The default option is not that everything stays the same uh, the way it is today. Uh, we have plenty of lessons we can learn from all across this continent of cities that took the, you know, sort of path of least resistance, spending less on public transportation, doing less planning, doing less uh, sort of sustainability priorities, and wound up with the uh, sort of perpetual but steady, uh, slow but steady increase of traffic. Um, and uh, we have plenty of examples of that. Or we've got the uh, compact mobility uh, uh, scenario that's been put forward uh, already, which uh, will be healthier because uh, it will have more physical activity and less uh, pollution, but also because it will make us wealthier. Now, this slide will take a little while for you to um, sort of digest, so it's going to stay up there maybe a little longer than uh, the others uh, did. <laughs> this is uh, a plot of uh, the modal uh, share of uh, motorized uh, private mode transportation in cities on the uh, Y uh, axis, the vertical, um, how much of the uh, population is driving around basically from zero to 100 uh, percent. And on the bottom is the GDP capita uh, for the region in US dollars. And this is from 2006 study that the uh, uh, International Union of Public Transportation did. But uh, when you, uh, it took a lot of data collection, but when you see basically three patterns of, uh, of cities, uh, uh, the sort of uh, most efficient, uh, the uh, mid-range, and the least efficient. And by efficient, we mean the uh, amount of uh, mobility in its relationship to uh, wealth uh, and productivity. You see cities, particularly in this North American pattern that's uh, uh, plotted along the red uh, uh, line, there that have a very uh, steep um, uh, increase uh, in uh, uh, mobility uh, without a corresponding expansion in uh, productivity of uh, GDP. You know, in, in, a, in an efficient world, in one where there's a lot of potential for uh, good employment and wealth to be generated, you don't have to have a lot of mobility to increase your economic uh, productivity. But if you notice, there's a lot of uh, Australian and American and even some Canadian cities uh, up there uh, on the red line that uh, are having a high share of people driving around in uh, private uh, individual uh, vehicles. That's actually holding back their uh, 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 regional uh, productivity uh, compared to cities in Europe and uh, Asia that have a different mix, that uh, have less single occupant vehicles uh, uh, driving around. And I think it's important for us to realize that uh, that uh, productivity um, is, uh, is real and that uh, transport investments that allow people to uh, live, work, and move more efficiently, uh, less distance, less uh, uh, energy, less time behind the wheel, really have a, an economic uh, payoff. And it can happen at different layers. You can see cities like Tokyo uh, at the bottom, uh, Zurich in the middle, Frankfurt, Munich. Uh, those are really in the sweet spots uh, where they've got a, a lot of regional uh, economic productivity without a huge amount of uh, uh, individual uh, motorized uh, uh, auto traffic along the way. Uh, I think we want to move as far to the right uh, on the graph in the future as we can without going up uh, uh, and maybe even going down uh, on the level of uh, motorized mobility. There's a clear relationship between those. The problem is that people who are stuck in traffic 
lose that perspective. Uh, it, it actually decreases your intelligence to be stuck uh, in, uh, in traffic. And there actually is research, which I didn't feel competent enough to digest, that shows you know, the effect of certain air pollution, uh, oxygen deprivation. I mean, it, it's, it, I'm not kidding that uh, you know, your cognitive function goes down. And in any given uh, city with uh, air quality, uh, the most polluted air in, in uh, a city is in bumper to bumper traffic uh, like this. Just think about it physically. You're just sucking in the exhaust from the vehicle uh, in front of you, and you're in an enclosed space. You might as well just breathe directly from the tailpipe uh, of the car uh, in front of you. That is the worst place you want to be for uh, health uh, purposes. And the more people are in that situation, the less uh, perspective and rationality they have uh, in terms of seeing transportation uh, options. But when they have uh, some alternatives, this is in Dubai, which just opened a, a light rail uh, system. Uh, it's not because their gas is expensive or because they uh, have uh, uh, an economic need immediately for this, but because they want to boost the efficiency and the sustainability of uh, their economy, hopefully uh, enough to help them through the carbon uh, shift uh, in the future. So there's opportunities that come with greater uh, efficiency uh, of, of transportation. I'll give you a spatial sense. Patrick has a much better uh, ability to analyze this than I do, but this one is so simple and straightforward, even I can figure it out. This is downtown Helsinki, uh, Finland. And uh, the area that's um, uh, surrounded uh, by the orange boundary, that's two super blocks, was their central bus uh, station or bus terminal area uh, before 2005. That's where all the buses from the region, uh, uh, not the local uh, inner city buses, but all the rest of them, sort of like your bus mall here on a super scale, they all showed up there and people stood around and froze most of the year in that outdoor space space, waiting for the buses, etc., to uh, come and go. That's a huge waste of uh, urban uh, space, uh, low productivity uh, and uh, low uh, development potential, especially in the heart of uh, the city. So uh, in 2005, uh, this uh, space was turned into this. Now, this is a slightly different perspective because I didn't have the helicopter to go and take exactly the same picture, but this is the front of the new um, multi-use residential office and commercial center that fills those super blocks. It's called Campy uh, Center. Still has all of the bus uh, services underground so that people actually can be comfortable and warm and shop and uh, play as well uh, in the uh, commercial development in, in a climate like uh, Helsinki's. That became a catalyst for that whole section of the city's redevelopment. Uh, and uh, uh, that in increased uh, 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 the uh, productivity and the value of uh, uh, urban, the urban uh, experience in, uh, in Helsinki. But it's uh, just obvious that uh, that could be, you could say the same thing about Surrey Center in our region. That's what we're looking at. The option is to go in this direction. Uh, and uh, there's a payoff that comes uh, from that. Uh, other areas, we've talked about uh, light rail. This is uh, outside of Paris, near uh, La Défense, uh, which is not the old, uh, sort of medieval, uh, beautiful part of uh, Paris. It's the modern, high-tech, uh, 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 um, sort of uh, high-rent uh, corporate office uh, area. And uh, it would look a lot different if you didn't have the rail, uh, the light rail uh, system as uh, a backbone to focus and concentrate uh, the development so that people in those offices can interact uh, one an with one another, lowering the cost of doing business, increasing the productivity in ways that uh, auto-oriented office parks, of which there's plenty too many in our region, and will be more if we don't uh, go this route uh, in places like Langley and Surrey. Uh, that's what we're uh, seeing the choice. Uh, so one of the, this is where we get back to health, which is uh, uh, definitely uh, connected to employment opportunities and economic opportunities. If you have a job, your health will be better. That was uh, in uh, Dr. Daly's uh, uh, information. And if you lose your job, your health will get worse. Um, and uh, here's some proof uh, of it from uh, the US uh, Gallup poll from 2013. There's lots of people, unfortunately, who have lost work in the last uh, few years in, in the US. And uh, the length of unemployment here, uh, self-reporting, asking people whether they've uh, got depression or being treated for it. You can see the longer you've been out of work after uh, about uh, five weeks, it starts to go up. 
Same thing with obesity, that uh, it's not just about uh, how you move, but uh, how you work uh, that will uh, affect that. The longer you're unemployed, you know, uh, food can be a comfort. Maybe there's less um, exercise and activity since you're busy scanning the uh, internet for job uh, options. Um, and uh, that also affects people's uh, uh, body mass. Here's some older data from uh, Ontario. This is from the 90s, but I think the uh, relationship would still hold, and I think that uh, since it is uh, from Canada, it will uh, be applicable here as well. They, they divided uh, uh, the uh, uh, whole province of Ontario into uh, uh, admission rates to uh, hospitals uh, in different areas by income, and uh, these are the admission rates, uh, people being rushed to the hospital with, uh, with heart attacks. We have a choice uh, in this region for our future. Right now, uh, we can move to the left uh, on this and uh, reduce um, heart disease from obesity and other uh, 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 sedentary uh, uh, health uh, problems um, and by increasing income as, uh, as well. Or if what we're really looking at is if we don't go ahead, um, there's going to be more people um, in the lower income uh, 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 groups that will be more at risk, I think, in the future. So what we're really facing here in terms of communication on the health front, I think, is to try and get people to see all of the connections between the investment in better urban and regional transportation and the health benefits to them and their children of uh, future economic opportunity. If their children can have uh, better jobs and more uh, employment and less unemployment, they will uh, live healthier uh, lives and will all be better off. Thank you. And our final speaker of the panel session before we get to the Q&A is Patrick Condon. Patrick, I'll invite you up and try and get your slides up online here. Slide show from the beginning. Voila. Thanks. Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Larry, for inviting me. And uh, Larry already accuses me of running long. That's probably because I don't speak as quickly as him. But I'll try to keep it really short so we can keep the uh, time for the conversation. And uh, on the way to that, I've shortened up the presentation considerably <laughs> and focused on just a couple things. Transit referendum is uh, about a big thing. It's about saving the planet. And uh, you can't hear me back there? How about now? <laughs> and. Uh, we have, to cons we have to cut our consumption of energy uh, by 90% to do that. That seems incredible. And the question is, what kind of city does that? The kind of city that does that is not, a one, like, is not one like this that's characterized by a f tall buildings in some locations and a lot of really small buildings and widely separated buildings in other locations. Because that produces a place like Los Angeles where the walking, biking, and transit share are combined only 15%. You wonder what kind of city actually does produce the kind of energy saving uh, that we're talking about. Well, we look at things like Copenhagen, where walking and biking share are 72%, a substantial increase. Or Amsterdam, where the walking, biking, transit share are 72%. Or Berlin, walking, biking, transit share, 70%. And Zurich, 66% bike, walk, transit share combined. I always talk about these things as combined because as has been pointed out, it's all one system, uh, walking, biking, transit, as opposed to the car system, which is a totally different urban system. And the surprise here is that walking and biking end up being the most important part of these uh, places. Transit's necessary as a facilitator of the more important things, the biking and walking, and these cities in the form that they have uh, operate that way. The question for us, though, is how can we make a city uh, that can do that for us as well, and how does this plan relate to that possibility? Parts of Vancouver are already fairly close to that, or at least have the potential of getting there within the next 20 or 30 years, so we have reason to feel optimistic. Uh, Many of you in the room, by the way, know that I've not always been favorable to the idea of uh, transit investments of any kind. So the little red stub line of the Millennium Line there uh, is one that I've been uh, uh, vocally critical of. But 
Anytime I'm in favor of 80% of something, like 80% of what a, a politician says, I'm going to go with that person. So I'm really in favor of 80% of this plan, and I'm really in favor of what the plan does for the 95% of the region that's not really directly served by that, that little red subway line. And I'm in, I'm in favor of it because it provides a system much like the system in Copenhagen and Berlin and Amsterdam where it provides maximum mobility generally rather than from periphery to some presumed center node. It provides mobility more generally and that's more compatible with the kinds of origins and destinations we actually have in our region and that are common to modern cities as demonstrated in these three maps. These three maps show you that people are going in every direction and ideally people are also working close to home, the places that are working the best here, uh, Vancouver intentionally not shown, are places like Surrey where people are working in Surrey or places like uh, Richmond, uh, where, play, where people are largely and increasingly working in Richmond. It's not the long distance trip, which is the issue. So as I said, I'm really favorable to the plan in Surrey, and I have a lot of experience out there in Surrey. It's my favorite city, besides Vancouver, I guess. And what's, uh, what I want to draw your attention to here is the, uh, the system, the universal system, or the, the homogenous system of transportation, particularly the provision of uh, the frequent transit network, which is the gray lines, and the green lines, which are the uh, rapid bus system. And of course, the red lines are the uh, all important, very rapid um, uh, transit system, this time on the surface. So the, you know, the sort of south of Fraser Kingdom is what we might call it, is really an, a massive area. And I'm drawing your attention to this one part of it, which is the area of the region that is to be served by this light rail, surface light rail system, from South Surrey up to Surrey City Center, and then from Surrey City Center over to the far right to uh, Langley City Center, and the one in this view that looks uh, quite short goes from Surrey City Center out to Guildford. And 200,000 people can and should be within a 10 minute walk of this system. We all know that if a system is more than 10 minutes walk away, it doesn't do you much good. You're not gonna use it. So our students in our, our urban design class uh, this last fall took a look at this 10 minute walk increment. Uh, one of my students, Miriam, I think I see you over there, uh, who participated in this class is here with us today. And that's a pretty significant geographic area. And if this investment is made, there's every likelihood that there will be the gravitational pull, or the economic development pull, to make it reasonable and profitable to build housing at reasonable densities within that 10 minute walk. So there's the group of uh, young students from around the world who came here to help us uh, figure this out at the very end of that transit line down a white, white rock on one of our first days. And there they, go, there they are going to work on the plan, which I'm about to show you what it would look like. They actually drew every little building that it would uh, take to house 200,000 people within a 10 minute walking distance of this new line. What you're looking at, for those who are not familiar with the region, is the diagonal line of uh, the uh, Fraser Highway all the way from uh, Langley City Center in the lower right back up almost to Surrey City Center. And all the red line, all the, all the colored areas there you see are the interventions that the students made finding places where you could actually build new or change existing buildings or build where there weren't buildings already, as well as green systems, all within a 10 minute walking distance. Closer in, Langley, Clayton area and Langley City Center. Langley City Center even closer, a little bit blurry, my apologies. Uh, and uh, South Surrey and then South Surrey all the way down to White Rock. There's enormous potential in this area within a 10 minute walk of this line. Plenty of capacity to build buildings that are capable of housing those 200,000 people. Not gonna happen without the gravitational pull and the real estate stimulus of this new line. And of course, there are other possibilities that come with that additional density. District heating systems become quite reasonable as shown on the right. and. Uh, a system that uh, brings things, uh, brings uh, walking and biking and, and additional uh, bus systems to that line. And th thus the buildings which might look something like this are uh, quite reasonable to expect, not 
likely to occur without the stimulus of the transit line. You don't have to live in a six-story building for this to work. You can still use detached building forms, duplexes, triplexes, townhouses, but the average density really needs to be 20 dwelling units an acre or above on average to get the walkability uh, benefits that we're talking about, and those come with the provision of transit in this vast area. So I think that's my last slide, and I did it way, way faster than you expected, so I'll just turn it, turn it back to you, Larry. 